Hello, welcome to I Don't Make This Stuff Up. I'm Thomas J. Beleza. I'm J.D. McGibney. Hi, everybody. And, and today we're going to be uh, really going into it, you know? We're gonna, what is the show? I mean, technically we're already inside something already. Yeah, yeah, but that was like, for me, over 40 years ago. You know? So have you been in this house the entire time? When? No, 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 no. Like, you're... <laughs> but... <laughs> As you can tell from the uh, from the title of the uh, of the episode, you know if, if you see the, you have to be able to see the title. If you can't, then uh, you're blind. But today we're gonna go. What does it take to be successful in entertainment in the entertainment industry? And we're gonna start off as always with JD McGivney and see if he can tell us. Uh, not that we're gonna laugh at him, which we will, or uh, critique him, which we can. And uh, obviously, he's gonna be a hundred percent correct uh, for the artist, but probably most likely incorrect for the business. Even though I've taught him. We've learned over the century that uh, you don't always retain everything because you have a, a, a soap dish for a memory. I, you mean I the memory of a soap dish? I couldn't remember. What? All right. So Honestly, your name's Chris. It used to be until I changed it to Daryl. <laughs> and then there was this weird mix-up. There was another Daryl uh, who had a podcast. Not not named this. It was just, was hey, it, it's Daryl. Oh, no. oh, what's that name of the podcast? Yeah, it was just, it's Daryl. Oh, was his name actually Bob, though? No, his, his real name was Christy, and she was a lovely person. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, did you know Wally and uh, and the uh, other robot were uh, uh, um, binary? You mean non-binary? Non-binary, yeah. Uh, I do now. Because, you know, they They're don't have robots. genitalia. That makes sense. Yeah. Anyway. All right, moving on. Beep, what does it take to be successful in the entertainment industry? In the entertainment industry. JD, why, why don't you start us off? What, what do you think? What do you think it takes to be successful in the entertainment industry? Uh, well, giving a very artist type answer, I'm going to say the first thing that you need is to one, be willing to, uh, have a lot of chutzpah, as my grandma would say, you need to have a lot of, uh, drive to actually do stuff. You can't, so you have to have a car. Um, uh, I mean, that would be nice, especially if you're in LA, you definitely need <laughs> oh, a car. You, yeah. You need a car or a public transportation car. out there is yeah. terrible. Although yeah. Uber and Lyft are, are quite convenient and relatively cheap for, uh, you know. Out there. Would you say Lyft is uber cheap? Ah, uh, it definitely is. Okay, I see what you did there. That was well done. Now, now to start off, you know, before we really get into uh, the nit and gritty, I'd like to just point out that JD said something that most artists say. Uh, however, what he did not say, which most people do not say, is how do I define success so I know where I'm going? Which is also a really good idea. I, again. Yeah, because you, oh. I was going to say you are correct. It's definitely something that is not uh, the first thing to pop in. To one's head. Now they're just like, oh, I want to be successful in this thing. And they're just like, I just need to start doing these things. And the, the reason we define success, which by the way, it's different for everybody. I mean, success could just be like, you know, one, one time when I was first starting like acting, but I wasn't really like, I didn't want to act, act. I just wanted to do background. I said to myself, I just, I just want to get a background gig and work on a set. So to me, getting that one gig was my definition of success. I did it. I was successful. Bada bing, bada boom. Bada boom. And then I was like, oh, I kind of like this. Same thing with comedy. In my mind, I was like, I want to do comedy. Once for, just for fun. Yeah, I just I just want to do it. So I say I did it. And, uh, you know, for me, if I could get a gig and perform in front of people, I didn't care if I knew them or not. Just one person would have been fine. Uh, and I get one laugh. I would feel I was successful in that goal. Now, I wasn't trying to be a successful comedian. I just wanted to be uh, somebody who did comedy at least once, and I defined it. And once I did that, now I had to readjust it because I was like, I like doing this. It was something that was fun to me. And you were able to give yourself uh, something to actually something attainable that you could plan towards and make yeah, happen, was, other than just like you know, an ethereal. Oh, this is like a, a mystical dream kind of thing. Yeah, it was extremely uh, 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 Specific. obtainable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I literally knew what. Uh, everything that had to happen for me to be happy in my success of that attempt. And, you know, honestly, uh, I did it. So, uh, when it comes to being successful in the entertainment industry, everything we are talking about today is going to be based on our definition as BBR production, what we define success as. And as always, we define success as making a living within your field of interest. A living is not a lifestyle. A life, uh, a living is uh, affording uh, a budget, a budgeted, average monthly overhead. Okay, lifestyle is basically you living off your wants, not your, not your needs. needs. So that's what success is, right? Even Periel <laughs> agrees with us. Agrees with us. He's just jelly. He hasn't been on the show in a long time. Yeah, 
I wonder what he's barking at. I'll go take a quick look. Yeah, go take a quick look. I, I'll uh, I'll jump. I'm gonna. I just. I'm not comfortable just talking. Okay, so now that he's gone, let's start the show. <laughs> no, I uh, just just kidding. The show the show starts the moment he 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 walks out of the scene. Um, what's what's nice about the way we define success is again, success is about making a living within your field of interest. A living is not a lifestyle. A living is uh, uh, affording a budgeted, average monthly overhead. So whatever it is your uh, interest is in entertainment to do, and you're making a living on that, you are successful. That's our definition. Everything we're going to go over today is about but uh, succeeding in that definition. You know, your, your definition of success is whatever you want it to be. You need to define it before you make an effort to do anything. Um, because if you have a definition to work towards, you'll eventually get there. If you're just sort of like, I want to be successful in acting, what does that mean to you? How do you define that? What, you know, when will you know you are there? Will you just know? It's better to have something justified. You don't have to necessarily write it down. However, writing things down is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but in this episode of uh, I Don't Make This Stuff Up, we're going to talk about how we became successful and the things we had to do and breaking down ultimately what you need to do to become that success. And we're going to ask JD questions along the way. Hey, when did I get here? Hey, JD. What's up, man? All right. So to start. Uh, what does it take to be successful in the entertainment industry? Believe it or not, there are five sides to a triangle of life. We have created this triangle of life to really break down what it is you need to do to run your business or your life like a business. One of those sides is known as the three needs of success. Another one is three needs of longevity. Another is three needs of purpose, uh, the eight assets of life. And of course, the fifth side, treat your life like a business. The first side we're going we're gonna to kind of talk about is the three needs of success. And what this is saying is these three needs of success will lead you to success based on our definition, but it won't create longevity. Longevity is something that has an extended career. So you take your success and you go. If you just do these things that we're about to mention, you will have your 15 minutes of fame. It will take you anywhere between one year and 10 years to achieve success in your field of interest, depending on how aggressive uh, or, you know, there's different variables. And efficiently. Effi yeah, you have to be efficient. You can't just kind of do things like, you know, smashing your head on the wall a couple of times is not going to be get you through that wall. I don't, I don't think it's going to be good for you at all. No, period. I, I mean, once in a while. Maybe it's like a cardboard wall. Yeah, I, I hit I hit a wall once with my head, and uh, I decided that um, when I woke up uh, <laughs> at the age 20, 15 years later, <laughs> that it might have been a bad idea. No, so... Um, Again, these three needs of success will lead you to our definition of success, but it won't create longevity and it won't fuel your purpose. Uh, but we'll get into that as, as the show progresses. The first area of three needs of success is broken down into network market practice. Networking is who you know. Marketing is who knows you. And practice is ultimately knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. right? So let's let's talk about networking a little bit. JD, what 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 is the definition of networking for us? Uh, building and cultivating relationships. And what does that mean? What does building mean? What does building relationships mean? Uh, I don't know if I can properly uh, define the building aspect, but I will give it a whack. Go I'm going to go with <laughs> building relationships is uh, getting to know somebody, introducing your introducing yourself, and having someone introduce themselves to you, and kind of building that foundation, as they say. I mean, that's one way you could look at it, but building is ultimately just simply that is just adding a, a collection of people to your list, your circle of influence. It's it's building basically your your uh, your list of opportunities. Who do you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Gotcha. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a relationship with them because, you know, the whole thing. Hey, I know S Sammy Hagar. And you're like, you do. Yeah, I met him at a party, yeah, but he doesn't know you. <laughs> and that's where marketing comes in a little bit later. But so. Uh, we can meet many people. We can take out their names. We can put it in our phone. We can say we met them once. But ultimately, uh, what is cultivating then? Cultivating is, would that be adding value to the relationship? Yeah, yeah. It would basically how you and I are best friends. It started off where we weren't. And that, that's how every relationship, we're strangers, right? So the moment we met, that was building to our circle of influence. Ooh. And the moment we put time and fat. effort. What? You call me fat? You call me circle? So the, <laughs> this is JD's last show. This is JD's last show. You're, you're not fat for a large person. Uh, <laughs> just, 
just uh just want you to know oh, that. God, there's almost water everywhere. <laughs> you're, you're what we call in the business reverse fat um uh but uh what? so what Who? what <laughs> what you're reverse fat you're skinny uh, anyway uh so what was I talking? Oh, yeah. Um, so when we met each other, that was sort of like we put ourselves into the circle, our circle of influences. But there really was no value to those relationships. The we have not cultivated them yet. We have not cultivated. So as soon as we started like uh, hanging out, talking, learning about one another and experiencing certain empathetic uh, moments. Exchange uh, mixtapes. Exchange saying <laughs> several mixtapes, even though you ignore all of mine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and more, <laughs> yeah. more importantly, I send them to JD and he always writes back. What the hell did you send me? I go, it's a it's a mixtape. He goes, what is a tape? <laughs> Can I put this in my MP3 player? And then I write back, what's an MP3 player? Can you just send me a Spotify playlist? Yeah. <laughs> if it's if it's not a DAC, not all right. Um, <laughs> a dad tape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so that's what a networking is ultimately. It's building and cultivating relationships. Uh, handing out a business card is not building or cultivating a relationship. That's actually known as marketing. They're they're known as uh, memory markers. Or if you just lay them around, that's littering. <laughs> yes <laughs> that is literally it's literally literally with litter literally. <laughs> your business card goes from being a thing you have to garbage <laughs> i mean unless someone's really bored and they start building one of those little like card houses <laughs> out of business cards honestly if i could build a card house right now high enough to cover you up <laughs> <laughs> my, my you, you know i wear glasses right <laughs> For some reason, I choose not to. No. <laughs> oh, JD's around. <laughs> oh no, I can't see. Uh. <laughs> I love how blurry you are. <sighs> anyway, so uh, so building and cultivating relationships. So the five uh, five points we're going to go over right now about networking is all ultimately the value of building and cultivating relationships. So not necessarily the technique to build and cultivate those relationships. Though if I had to say what they were, is literally get out there, get involved, meet people, take note of who you met, and then follow up. And then lunch, dinners, hang out, cultivate, help them out. Yeah, literally put time and effort into them. But that's not what we're talking about. Networking is a part of your journey to succeed. Without networking, you will not succeed. It's impossible. No man in island does this, or no, no person in island. So. Yeah, no, no person in island. And one of the main reasons why you will not succeed if you don't network is because networking is the prime purpose for your success is not about you. It's about the people around you. The, the relationships you build with people will lead to opportunities only. How did you guys meet? Oh, all right. We, we can answer that real quick. So uh, we've talked about this a few times. Jay, yeah, how do we, we meet? Uh, we actually, we had, we have a few mutual friends that we've, you know, over the years, apparently. But uh, one of those. Mutual and we friends, like none of them. No, okay. it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of our mutual friends uh, was taking uh, Thomas's business classes when he had his theater on Long Island mm -hmm. and uh, the mutual friend reached out to me because at the time I was uh, I was in a local band is like JD uh, you should totally meet this Thomas guy he's really cool he's got a lot of knowledge uh, he also has a beard <laughs> and uh, he's into metal you should reach out to him and take some of his classes so I trusted the mutual friends opinion and I reached out to Thomas and uh, he hasn't got rid of me yet yeah yeah I've oh. tried many a times I, I've, I've told him to move to LA great opportunities are out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like a cockroach crossed over with like lice. Oh my god, that's a fair. <laughs> you need you need like radiated shampoo in order to get rid of me. Oh my god, that's true. <laughs> All right, let's let's get back to the lesson. So your success is not. Thank you for that question. Nate. Uh, your success is not about you. It's about the people you uh, that that are around you. You know, and opportunity only opportunity will only come with these people. You know, and it's not that you're creating relationships. It's not that you build and cult relationships to get something out of somebody. Even though we call it the circle of influence, it's the circle of influence because these people will influence good positive habits. If you're around people. Like wiping your feet when you walk into an establishment, <laughs> or you know, following up. Man, uh, you know, J JD always follows up after we like hang out and we haven't seen each other in a while. I, I kind of like how that makes me feel. I'm gonna do that, you know. And that's the thing. You might even see like the way the way somebody pays for it. Not not that everyone could afford to do it, but you might see that somebody always pays for the whole table. You go out to eat, and they're like, "No, nah, I got it." And that that is a habit of success. That's a habit of building, and cultivating relationships, doing right by people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Making them feel appreciated and wanted and respected. 
Well, yeah, you know, it's also it's it's nice to give once in a while, you know. And if you can afford to give, always give, right? Okay. Um, oh wait, we got another question from Nate. I like questions. Why do you think there is so many homeless in LA? I know it's off topic, but I would like to hear your opinion on the subject. I actually have uh, uh, a a fairly strong opinion on this one. No, let me hear it, Jenny. Uh, living. Wait, let me a- put your mic on mute. Um, what the crap? <laughs> Uh, To answer Nate's question, uh, from what I understand, there are a lot of issues with uh, state-funded programs for people with uh, mental uh, illness. And so I think it was back in the 80s, there was like a a significant drop-off in that. So if you notice, a lot of the homeless people in Los Angeles uh, tend to have something that's a little left of center going on with them and makes it difficult for them to interact with society. But there are very little state-funded programs that help on a wider scale. And that, uh, from what I understand from people that have been in Los Angeles for decades or have been natives, is one of the main reasons why uh, there is a large homeless issue out there. Yeah. I mean, if I was going to say anything about that subject, I would say that homelessness is based on several variables. However, those variables don't influence everybody. I mean, some people just are bad with money management and they just they don't know how to handle money. They end up losing money. They still have jobs. But they live in a car or they or a van down by the river or a van down by the river. Um, you know, sometimes they, they, they don't even have a car, but they still have a job. They still find a way to shower. It's just they, they're just terrible money managers. Others would be the majority of homeless people would it does come down to mental illness. Um but also, you know, there, there's massive stories of people who are like millionaires who just are done. <laughs> They're just done and they just leave society and they just it's just that freeing feeling of knowing that you don't have to worry about like in there. I mean, they're millionaires, so they're as homeless as they want to be until, you know, like yeah. I was actually uh, I have a, an acquaintance of mine that's in that situation. He's, you know, very he's set. He's, he's got a couple of businesses, yeah. but he was just like, you know, what, I'm done with all this stress and he within the past like six months to a year is like i'm just gonna get rid of most of my earthly physical like possessions he has like uh, i think he has like one apartment that he uses as like a home base to like recharge every now and again but he basically is kind of like living a nomadic lifestyle at the moment yeah yeah that's just it's it's amazing what that kind of we, we attach ourselves to which by the way will come up later in what we're talking about just in general is managing of your money and managing your wants and needs and you know sometimes we allow things to control us we allow money to control us we allow objects to control us we allow our desires of wants to control us and you know it could lead to so many things uh, as far as homeless goes, you know, th- there are cases where I helped uh, uh, communities and stuff like that. Like I got involved in like those uh, the centers and like, you know, d- to donate clothes and stuff like that. And um, like the Goodwill people, not the Goodwill. Like they're literally like homeless, like, like the sh- an actual shelter. Yeah, they're an actual shelter. And one of the things I, I, um, I, I realized because a lot of them are a lot of people are really nice. They're just homeless. And uh we, I would talk to them and, you know, some of them definitely <laughs> are, are, are definitely crazy. But um, I would talk to them and and some of them, they just they just don't have like they'll have kids and they're just like, how do I just make sure my kid eats? So they're not like they don't realize they have to kind of like get their you know, like when you're on a plane. And, and like the, the plane is going to crash. Oh, you have to put the mask on. And they say put the oxygen on your face before you put it on the kids. Yeah. These people, as selfless as they are, are giving all, everything they have to make sure their kids can eat. But they're not taking care of themselves to make sure that they have a foundation. So that their kids will eat. Yeah. And um, but, you know, they they, uh, they also found there's like a system that they, they've created. You know, there's groups of homeless people that they're living. They're living good lives in homeless situations because. You know, it's like somebody imagine you loved camping. Imagine your life was camping. You lived in the wilderness. You're basically homeless, you know, but except if you own a home and you could come home to some. And some people just they excel in that world. And so it's not always a bad thing for people to be homeless, but um, they don't always choose it. You know, sometimes the craziest things happen. Sometimes some of the people I met, they got sick and while well, they were sick in the hospital. They couldn't work, and therefore they ended up having to. Yeah, and then they would get out of the hospital and they go home, and they couldn't work because they literally were getting better. You know. Yeah, you like you have to heal. Doctor's orders. Yeah, and they just they just went they just went homeless because they lost their job and money ran out. And... Unemployment's not. Yeah, it's terrible. Terrible. Which it, it sucks that they uh, you know 
that is like an issue for like yeah yeah homelessness is is, is terrible and uh, uh another another thing is like i offered i offered one of them like because i just kept seeing them all the time i was like i was like listen what if i could uh help you get on your feet get a job and everything and they were like nah <laughs> and i was like why not and they're like i'm fine i literally have everything i want I'm eating, right? I'm eating in front of you. I'm at this place eating. I get my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Sometimes I don't. So then I got to go on the street and ask people for a dollar or two. You know, if I eat today, I still ask for money. So I have money for tomorrow just in case I don't eat. You know, I got plenty of clothes when it's cold. I know where to go, you know. And I was just like, oh, okay. All right. You know, and that was weird to me because I was thinking like, you know, wouldn't you want a little help? In it? But they don't need help. They, that person does not want the help because they're fine. But not everyone's like that. Not everybody is like that. But moving on. Uh, so your success is not about you. It's about the people you surround yourself with. And it's important because, remember, your circle of influence is not about how they can influence your career or your life. It's how they influence good, positive habits. Basically, if you're around people who are doing uh, good habit-based things. You'll pick up those good habit-based things. Yeah, just if you're around that. people that are doing heroin. Probably not a good idea. Yeah. It, yeah. If you realize you're always hanging out with people always doing drugs or just playing video games and you're sitting here, I want to have a career. I want to open a business. Like you got to start hanging out. One of the things that was ever said to me that made my brain shake with the <laughs> awareness was uh, if you want to be a successful musician, start hanging out with successful musicians. And my first response was like, well, how do I even do that? I'm not. Never, and, and that was me not utilizing my entrepreneurial brain. You are talk about later. I was just creating a wall. I was like, eh, how? There's no way. How am I going to? This is what all I know. You're doing a JD. And I was excuses. doing a JD. Yeah. I, I don't do that anymore. Uh, unless I absolutely don't want to do something. Then I say, I can't do that. Yeah. No, you just go, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> don't want to do that. Which is not a wall. And it's not an excuse. You're yeah. just like, I don't want to. Yeah. I do not want to do that. I, I'm very confident in my choices because of everything I've been through. But anyway, moving on. Be nice to everyone. You never know who someone is or knows. That's an extremely important rule to live by when it comes to networking. It's in fact, it's rule number one. Be nice to everyone because you never know who someone is or who someone knows. Or who someone will be. Well, that that's the who someone is aspect. Because, uh. you know, you don't know who they are. You don't know their life. You don't know their story, right? So networking really is uh, about those two things. The third, the third thing that you should really pay attention to is every opportunity you will have comes from people. Every single opportunity. If you don't believe that, who comes to your shows? Who watches your movies? Who sees your comedy? Who buys your CDs? You know, who who signed you? An agent, manager? Is that you or someone else? I mean, I kind of want a robot agent now. <laughs> I am a robot agent. Call me Jim. Um, Gate Finder 5000. <laughs> I will get you seven shows. Um, the other thing is like who who signs your band? Who 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 you know who does the film? Who's the director? Who's the producer? Who's the writer? Who's the other actors? Who casts you in the film? Who casts you? Every opportunity you will have comes from people. If you go to somebody who you've never met and it's a casting and you meet them and you have a really great rapport in the room and you're not just doing the lines, really like, so I'm reading the lines. Okay, I'm I'm uh, Michael. Jesus, I can't believe you did that. Why? And then they do their line. Uh, could you please get off the feet? And it's like, please, please, please get away. You know, and then the, the, the crappy script is done. And then and then uh, and then you leave. You didn't do anything. You didn't build a rapport. So when you go in, they ask you, you know, how are you doing? Or, you know, you know, everything all right. And sometimes you only have time for two sentences. Uh, you have a response. You have the, the ability to say something, and they have the ability to respond. One time, I went in and I made a quick joke, you know, because the black the back wall was blue, and uh, and I go I go uh, I go if, if I if I do any blue humor, will I vanish in this wall? Wah, wah. And then she looked up. She goes, "You must you must do stand up," and I go. Mostly not not up. after that reaction. <laughs> and then she started laughing. And then she's like, all right. And then we did like a take. And then then she was like, you want to do another take? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, you know what? I love your energy. Why don't you try it this way? Because they're definitely looking for something like this. And I was like, OK. You know, and just that boop, even not that you have to make stupid jokes. But yeah, but you you, you went with like the genuine like yeah. dialogue. You made an effort to connect and not just, oh, I'm here to do my lines. I'm amazing, awesome, and unique. Yeah, yeah. I went in as me. And and if you notice, I did not say, hey, you know, uh, you know, you look nice today. No, I did a with conversation. I was talking about the wall. 
made it easy for them to jump in and join yeah, the conversation, exactly. not just be like, oh my God, I'm so, uh, I don't know how to react to this. Yeah. One of the worst things you could do when someone says, how are you doing? Or, or like, how was your day? Or tell me a little bit about yourself is literally do those things. If someone says, how was your day? And you tell them how your day was, you're, you're, you're ruining your chances to build and cultivate a relationship. Because you're just taking over the conversation. <clears throat> But more importantly, that's not really what they want to hear. You know, even though they're asking it, they, people don't always know what they want to know about you. So they come up with these generic questions. You know, it's like when we do interviews, I'm like, oh, I hate these questions where they're like, why did you start music? You know, like, and you What's just. What's your favorite color? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you could go back and give anyone some advice about making music, what would it be? I'd be like, don't make music. <laughs> But anyway, um, uh, so w those opportunities are small moments where you get to be yourself. You get to kind of talk about who you are without talking about it. And that's that's the showing versus telling. So, you know, if you want people to know what it is you do or that you have a dog, you wouldn't say, oh, you know, I have a dog. What kind of dog? When did right? I get a dog? But instead, if someone's like, oh, how was your afternoon? You go, oh, it was pretty good. I got the, you know, I got to walk my dog. And that's always nice because it's just just getting to get the fresh air and, you know, and kind of like get get out of my head before i get here and then they're like oh you have a dog so you know instead of going i have a dog i'm a dog person like you don't have to tell people what you are show people what you are show them through example you know i, I you know i walk on my dog i am you know i'm doing pretty good my mind is clear i got to walk my dog and like just kind of like be on the air so that was nice oh we got another nate question <clears throat> you basically nate have to have Inter interrelationship skills, and if you don't, then work on it. Correct. Always, always work on your networking skills. Work on the ability to connect with people, but also don't overstay your welcome. There is like that rule. Um, you have to be able to read people's body language and like read the room as they. Now nah, you don't have to do any of that. You just got to know that I have to leave within X amount of time, no matter who it is, right? So if you ever see me in a room with people, I move around the room constantly. I'll come back to you. But I'll always move around the room because the more you move, the more pattern interrupts you're creating and also the interest of wanting to keep talking to you. Mm. So if you limit your time with them, they can't get bored of you. They but can't. at the same time, you're also showing equal uh, attention to everybody. You're making everybody. And no one pays attention to that. No one's no. seeing you like, oh, look at this. This guy talks no, no, to no, everybody. No, 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 no. I wasn't saying that part. I'm saying like you're actually giving time, your time to more people. So people are like, oh, this person is giving me their time. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but they don't think no one thinks like that. No one's like, oh, thanks for your time. Like, it's just what you're doing is you're trying to pinch them. Boom, 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 boom. And you pinch them with emotional moments. Like, I'm going to pinch you. I pinch. I pinch. The, the pinching is ultimately like, how do you do you make them feel something? Did you make them laugh? Did you make them think? Did you make them uh, be intrigued when you leave? When you come back, did they go? I was thinking about the thing you said before you left. Now, you know, you hooked them. So you give them a little extra time, but you don't have to worry about body language if you're just limiting yourself to anywhere from three to five minutes a person. Mm. If you're it, because you'll never overstay your welcome in that time, you just can't, you know, unless you come in hard, you know, like if you're just like, oh God, you're wearing that shirt here today, like you you lost, mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're, you're anyway, or they're you know in the bathroom and you're like, hey, and they're like, I'm trying to, you know, yeah. do a number two. How how do you pee with that? Look how tiny it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I only pee next to short people, show. so they don't uh, they can't look over. Um, also, with networking, last two things: create opportunity for others. Saying that because every opportunity you will have comes from people, you too should also create opportunities for others. Not the bad. Not the bad. What? You too. All right, then, JD. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your mic? Good. Um, the the idea is that. People will like you after a while. They will grow to like you. You will build and cultivate a relationship that creates the interest of wanting to be around you, which also is an influence of marketing, but we'll get into that. Um, but your job isn't just to take from people. If you keep getting opportunities from people and you're not returning opportunity, an opportunity doesn't necessarily mean have to be involved with you. Like, I don't have to work with you to give you an opportunity. I can refer you to someone. And that, or I can introduce you to somebody just to build another relationship. And that's giving you opportunity. That's creating those opportunities. And that helps build and cultivate relationships even faster, especially if the value of those introductions work out, you know, because then they go, oh, man, Thomas knows so many people. Every time he introduces me to somebody, something great happens. That's going to go far because then what are you going to do? You want me to know your friends. Why? Because I could give them opportunities. So I'm using people's selflessness 
to be, I mean, selfishness to be selfless, because I know I'm not, I'm not doing it to get anything out of you because it could take a day, it could take a year, it could take 10 years before you get anything from that person. But the idea is that if you give enough and not too much outside your boundaries, but if you give enough to help others, it will lead to opportunity just in general. So is this, is this why they say things like you get what you give? It's where like, if you, you know, the more you give, the more people are, are interested in the relationship that is being developed. Well, yeah, because if if I just focus on giving for for me to get, right, I'm not really going to get as much as you think. But if I focus on giving to help others get, it will give back to me. What is Nate saying here? We got to lose him. What you say about others says more about you. That is very true. Yeah, that is true. You know, how, how, how you talk about others, well, it depends. You know, there is a... There's gossip, and then there's uh, resentment, and then there's sort of like getting stuff off your chest. You have to be able to decompress. Mm -hmm. That's why you should go to therapy. Uh, you have to be able to decompress. But there is there is like pattern will create truth. So if, if I talk about somebody and their pattern has shown that truth, I'm not really talking about them. <laughs> You're talking about the pattern that you've observed. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is who they are. They do this, you know. But another thing is, if you see people not doing right by you, don't introduce them to people. Don't work with them. But you don't have to necessarily talk bad about them all the time. Uh, however, you, just you, you act accordingly. Yeah, you act accordingly. But some people think, like, uh, talking bad about people is the negative thing. But however, if, like, you and I are best friends, there's going to be stuff we have to feel like we can talk to one another to get stuff off our chest so we don't let it build up. And, uh, you know, it's important to have a confidant that you can uh, you can talk to. The last thing on networking is work together with people for the benefit of everyone. That's an important statement for networking. You do not build relationships to better your life. You build relationships to better the lives of those involved in that moment. So if you have five or six friends you're working with, everyone in that group should be rising together, even even if one of you outshines the other even if one of you gets another opportunity uh, quicker than the others the idea is that in their success once they have a foundation in that success they'll be able to start helping everyone else come up you don't have to rise at the same time but you have to be able to look out for one another and help yeah. each other as a group yeah there's a there's a director uh that i met what's a director uh they uh they, they draw a bunch of tiny sketches like over and over again and they use that for uh pygmies you were saying? <laughs> uh, there, there's a there's a director I met out in uh, in Los Angeles. Who, nice kid too. Yeah, he's, he's really nice. Blonde. Man. Uh, Brandon Dermer is his. Name. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And he's uh, that's basically how he started his career. You know, he started. Uh, he basically built a team, like yeah. an entire like crew that he that he works with, and uh, he ended up like basically rising. You know, pretty quickly. But he every project that he works on, he brings the same people with him, literally yeah. everywhere. But more importantly, with that situation, like if he hears an opportunity for someone, he should talk about his people first. Not that you should have a neat a niche or I mean a click. You shouldn't create a click, but you're you know. But the people you you, you invest your time in for like those yeah, relationships, yeah. you should look out for one another. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm looking for a, a cinematographer. You know what? I know too. You want to go to Bill? Yeah, yeah. Here, here's Bill, and here's Christy. Yeah, choose which one you like the best, right? Because uh, eventually you're gonna have more of everybody in the same group yeah uh, uh, the idea though is like if i get an opportunity to produce something uh, obviously i'm going to go to the, the first people i think of even if they're not qualified <laughs> qualified co qualified are going to be people that i have appreciation for or that i want to see grow or that make me feel better in the environment like they add value to the environment and not even and they could as long as you're comp by the way uh, if you're competent in what you do you're gonna. I'm definitely gonna bring you along, if you're incompetent. But if you're if you're a cinematographer and you can't turn the camera on, you're probably not gonna get referred. You're not a cinematographer then. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the difference between a cinematographer is and a DP? Uh, a director of, of photography. The cinematographer operates the camera, and the DP does not. Is that my correct? Uh, yeah. They uh, a cinematographer does exactly the same thing a DP does, but they also hold the camera. Gotcha. They usually, you know, they they. they but the DP. Yeah, DP just sets the shots. Gotcha. He goes, I want this. Yeah, make make this up. Make it pretty. All right, so moving on to marketing. As we said, networking is who you know. Marketing is who knows you. Ooh. All right, so this is this is all about people remembering who you are, your values, etc. Right, so one of those things, uh, 
that is important is your marketing is ultimately what are your morals, ideals, and missions in life. And you want to show those through action. So you got to get involved, right? Um, mar marketing, as we define it here, is designing a brand to build awareness, which creates interest that ultimately generates sales. So people buy into your brand's message uh, emotionally. Um, but when you are thinking of yourself as the brand, you got to basically focus on what are your morals, ideals, and missions. And you don't tell people that. Like, I don't go, JD, I love helping people. No, I have to help people. You literally help people. Yeah, I literally have to do it. Even if it's for free or they pay me, that's what I do. I'm known as the person that can help people. And sometimes I help people that are like, hey, I don't have a lot of money. Can you I'll be, look, we'll do it this way. If you make money, you give, give me what you feel I'm worth. You know, and again, within your boundaries. Mm -hmm. don't overextend don't help people that are you know in, uh, that are not grateful yeah don't let the uh, leechy people in yeah money. yeah not not that not that you should get anything for helping people but like you know there's a certain point where you're just like this person is literally just taking yeah they're they are using i feel like me. i'm missing a couple of pints of blood as well yeah what's going on what's going on so you know what are your morals ideals and missions and then think about how you can get involved in your industry or even just slightly outside your industry to build and cultivate relationships utilize your marketing your brand as a way to build and cultivate those relationships you want to kind of like mix everything together everything you do must affect everything you do right uh, another thing about marketing is be around like-minded people to elevate a brand's message what that means is if if jd was like a huge gamer right and uh and and i was not <laughs> we probably we probably would not uh uh work out very well because he would always be playing games even though he does music if he plays games more than he likes playing music or he loves music but he plays games so much i might not want to be involved in that right doesn't mean he's a bad person just means we're not like-minded like, sorry i can't just this i can only take so much tetris dating yeah <laughs> But but if I if he likes helping people and I like helping people and then whatever else we do is whatever else we do and he play let's say he plays games all the time but he loves helping people he might be somebody that I I would get along with and it would help elevate my brand because if we're both helping people and we're finding ways to help people then uh, ultimately that's that's uh, instilling the reality of your missions your brand your morals and ideals um, and remember marketing your brand. As as much as it seems like uh, the computer robotic uh, representation of you need a brand, you know, beep, boop, beep. a brand is actually what people remember of you and it defines their referral of you. Ooh. So the way someone remembers you, the, the way the way they look at you, the way they they recall you emotionally, like how they, if they hear your name or they see a photo of you, what they instantly think of you is important to how they refer you. So the last time you meet, the last time you hang out with someone could ultimately influence if they do or do not uh, refer you because it's based on like that re that interaction. However, if the majority of your interactions are positive, you're more than likely to be on their mind when they think of a specific thing. So if JD is a guitarist and I have a really good uh, opinion of him and he, and when I think of guitars, I go, oh, JD, JD is a guitarist. That guy. I'm going to think of him in the referral game. Uh, whereas even though I know probably 600 guitarists, you know, in my lifetime, that's a lot of guitar players. Oh, just, well, being in the music industry for 10 years, I I met how many, you know. You've uh, also had like 50 other guitar players in Tenebra. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't call them guitar players. But, oh, uh, ooh, but yeah. anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do it. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> you can let the evil cause through your blood. Uh, <laughs> oh, I feel you your die. <laughs> You will die. <laughs> and again, two weeks that some would call unnatural. <laughs> That's like, like one of the best scenes in the the uh, Revenge of the Sith. That opera scene, even though like the opera scene is weird, that story is awesome. Anyway, uh, so what people remember of you defines their referral of you so keep that in mind how you build your relationships and what you show people is important to that referral uh and again if you're living your truth if you're living your morals ideals and your missions people will remember that aspect of you if i go to jd and i say i like doing this 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 and this this is who i am this, these are my talents and my skills that's not proof 
proof is in truth, and the truth is in action. Ooh. I like how the first part of that rhymed. You like that? Yeah, it's like you're a poet, and you didn't even know it. Yeah, I made that up on the spot. Ooh. Yeah, all this, I just, I, I don't make this stuff up, but that I did. <laughs> All right, marketing. Uh, so 99% of the stuff you don't make up. Yeah, yeah. Except yeah. for that one little ad. G give it, give or take. All right, the last thing about marketing is telling people who you are is nothing compared to showing them. But yeah, basically, that's what we just said is ultimately, if you want, if your mission, ideals, and morals are a very specific thing, all right, they could also be generalized, but whatever they are, how can you represent that in truth? How can you represent that in action, effort, uh, involvement, um, you know, taking the time to say, this is who I am based on what I'm doing. Let your results. And by the way, that doesn't mean I'm a guitarist. So I, I'm a great guitarist. So I want people to see I'm a great guitarist. So I'm going to just record videos of me playing guitar. Great. <laughs> that's not brand. Because that's just you doing something. You are not what you do. Yeah, yeah. What you do is not your job, right? So you're not defined by the things you do. You're defined by the morals ideals and missions that you do and that stuff is playing on stage is not the same as maybe you're always the person that helps helps every band in that night you know load uh, load in load out maybe you're the actor that goes around and says hey does anyone need water i know i know we're about to go on i know we're about to go uh you know on stage soon but uh, anyone need water so when we go to our first break it's ready for you Oh, uh, aren't you performing too? <laughs> like, yeah, 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 but I'm ready. I'm ready. So I just helping out everybody, make sure everybody's good. Those things are more powerful than I am a great actor. Yeah, or, people will always remember how you made them feel. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. And then uh, finally, with the, with the three needs of success, we're into practice. Practicing is know yourself. So networking is building and cultivating who you know. <laughs> Marketing is. <laughs> Who knows you? Okay. And practices. Know thyself. That's right. And how do we know ourselves? Well, part of that is taking a, uh, a, a consensus of who you are. Think once in a while, every three months or so, or every four months, sit back and say, what are my strengths and weaknesses? So basically once a quarter. Once a quarter or nickel, whatever. When you're what? doing your quarterly taxes. Yeah. When you're doing your <laughs> quarterly taxes once a year. Uh <laughs> But yeah, you want you want to take a note of, of of your qualities of who you are and what you represent and where are your strengths and weaknesses, because part part of your success is own up to your mistakes, flaws, and inconsistencies, right? Because no one's going to judge you for those things if you own up to it. They can't. It's like uh, if anyone had the uh, the misfortune of seeing uh, Eight Mile. At the end of that movie, he just goes off and rips himself up. You know, like he just he Eminem's character just uh, what's his name Rabbit or something. I've actually never seen Eight Mile. See, you haven't had the misfortune. Uh, in that movie, he just rips himself up. He just at, there's a rap battle at the end of the movie, and he, he just says everything possible that the other guy could potentially see. Who's Anthony Mackie, by the way? Really? Yeah, he's oh. he's right. So then Anthony Mackie's character is like, I can't, I can't say anything. He just said everything. He literally just he just destroyed himself. Oh. And Mike that crap. destroyed me. Yeah. So owning up to your stuff allows you a chance to correct your stuff or at least be aware of, you know, your, your, your inconsistencies. Right. And then the other aspect is be aware of your strengths to add to the solution, Ooh. not to have strengths because you're so good. You know, like when you're good, you're good through results, not boasting. If you, if you are aware of your strengths, you want to utilize them in a way that adds to a solution, but not to show off. You don't want to be like, I got this, you know? You want to do it so this way you can able to help everybody benefit, not just to gloat. You want to actually do good. Well, it's not necessarily about people. It depends on the situation. It's about the solution of the situation. So let's say it's, you know, something as simple as putting a door up. What are your strengths in that situation? How can you help get that door up mm. if you're working with people? You know, if it's somebody that needs money, right, how can you help in that situation? If it's somebody that needs to get to a show, how can you help in that situation? You know, but it could also be something that's more uh, mental or physical in the sense of, you know, again, putting a door up or, you know, maybe I need help with my my uh, with a math assignment or something. And you're like, oh, I'm good at math. Let me help you out. But you don't have to say you're good at math. Just help you like, hey, can I see what you're working on? Hey, uh, do you understand this, 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 and this? One no. plus two uh, does, in fact, equal three. 
this <laughs> I'm actually having trouble with this. Yeah, but if they say they're having trouble, if you notice what I said though, like I wasn't like, hey, this is how to do it. You go. Let me take a look. At are you? It. Yeah. May I look at it? You know. Uh, do you know how to do this? What is what is this process? And if they say no, and you go, may may I give advice? And they're like, oh, yeah. And you go, well, did you know that uh, if you do this and this, you could figure that out? And they'd be like, really? And then you show them an example. And then you don't have to do it for them, but you show them examples. You show them how to do it, and now you just gave them a skill, right? You taught them how to fish. You taught them how to be a fish. That's right. Um, <laughs> I see you took the that? scales on that one. Yeah. <laughs> This is definitely JD's. <laughs> All right. Um, when it comes to practice, like I said, when you're good, you're good through results, not boasting. You do not have to show people how amazing you are by telling them. Right? Just do what you do, and then that's it. You know, when I when I was in the music industry more full time, uh, in the beginning, I was always like, I am the best guitarist. I'm gonna be the best guitarist. I'm gonna just keep getting good. I'm just, it's just. Uh, and then one day I was, people started saying, man, you're so good. And I started going, eh, you know, I practice. I just like playing. And it just changed my life. Like everything was better. Everything just, I had no pressure. I had no interest in being the greatest guitarist. I just wanted to be able to do what it is I wanted to do. You That's wanted to it. get whatever was in your head out. That's it. it. I, I mean, I know, I know back then I was an amazing guitarist, but there was just something about me that just switched where I was like, I don't, why do I need to say it? You know, and, oh, pe and people and are saying, it it? well, it, 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 it matters enough to where you wanted to, you know, uh, get out what you like. You said, get out what you wanted to do. Yeah, but yeah. what did it matter that you were the best guitar player, quote unquote? I mean, I started getting on like, you know, back then you had like the the, the boards, you know, like the message boards. Ugh. And uh, also like throughout the, the scene, people were putting my name along with other band. Like, you know, it'd be great if we saw these people play together. Like they would make a great band, and I was on a lot of those lists. Oh, like as Neil, a guitarist, like Neil Young and Thomas Chabaleza. <laughs> what? Django Reinhardt. That's all Neil Young songs are. What about Django Reinhardt? Who? Wait, do you is, not, that, is that a pilot? Wait, do you not really? Okay. Know, do you really not know Django Reinhardt? Who? Django. Django Reinhardt, like the gypsy jazz guy. All right, we're going to keep going. Oh, my God. <laughs> that guy's nuts. Yeah, well, probably because his name. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what did you name me, mother? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> no, no, no. I will be nuts. All right. Finally, know when to lead and know when to be led. Ooh. Practicing is knowing yourself, but also being aware that sometimes you can lead when you need to step up. And sometimes you could step back even when you should be leading. You know that, like, you don't need the lead in this situation. Allow someone else to take the reins, okay? Unless you own the business or you are the brains of the business. <laughs> I'm just here to look pretty. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. ring the bell. There are certain times where, like, uh, j and &E and I have talked about the, you know, the psychology of what an alpha, like, if you're in a room, the alpha isn't really the best person. The alpha is the person that people go to. So you could be the quietest person in the room that shows the least value and everyone goes to you and goes, what do we need to do next? Or what's, what do you need me to do? Or da, da, da. And that person is the alpha, uh, male or female, right? So, um, a lot of times in every situation, I am usually the, what do we do next person? And I'm just like, I, I'm hiding. <laughs> How do you even find me? I'm yeah. hiding in a closet Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> covered in a sheet. We don't know. And then everyone, then, then people usually go. Why does he have to be in, in, in charge of everything? And and then I'm like, any any one of you can take charge. I used to do that with band all the time to everybody. They'd be like, well, you're the you're the you're the person who runs the band. I go, what do you want to do? And then you get cricket, cricket. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's oh well, actually, it would always be let's write a new song or uh or let's do a show. And I go, all right, you're gonna set it up, you're gonna write it out, no, let's write the song together. That was my. I hated that. I'm like, you want to write the song together? Very, I've learned that that you hate writing songs together with people. It's like someone just write it and tell me what to play. Yeah. So this is what would happen though. They'd start jamming, right? Mm -hmm. Boom. You know, my the bass player start Boop. playing, the guitars would start playing. Of a, by the way, that the bass is all automatically an upright. Yeah, it's always an upright. But the funny thing is, as soon as they start playing, I would just watch and listen, and then my brain is like orchestrating like what what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I start playing, what does everyone do? Stops. No, they start following me. <laughs> 
And I'm like, well, you want me to write this? <laughs> yeah, I'm following you again. Just say, I like what you did. All right. So moving on. Let's move on. Okay, so now uh, uh, the three needs of longevity creates a career, you know, longevity. It creates uh, sustainability in your success. So again, the three needs of success will lead you to success based on our definition. Right? Uh, network market practice is all about relationships. This is more or less about control, taking control of your opportunities. Ooh. Okay. And this the first is there thing a joystick involved? Yeah, there is there is yes. Okay. She's a lovely lady. Oh. Uh so the first section of the three needs of longevity we're gonna talk about is management of time, money, and people. However, the three needs of longevity is management, entrepreneurial brain, and talent. And we're gonna go over those. Uh, but we're gonna start with management of time. Uh we're gonna we're gonna touch on uh three three main topics of this real quick, okay. Uh, first of all, time is limited to about 80 summers. On average, we live about 80 years. So you get 80 good summers in there, right? How do you want to spend your summers? Do you want to be controlled by time and things and, and have zero to no choice and figure out where I want to go? Well, your life begins with time management, you know, because if you can control time by saying no to things, you're in control. It limits your stress. It limits your activity. If you're like, I have to get this thing done. You're letting that thing control you. Yeah, you're not in control of your time. You're now being pulled along by by a fake thing. Everything in this world is fake. We give it value. Because if it was important, why are you the only one doing it? Wouldn't everybody have to be working on that thing to make sure it gets done? If it was that important? You need to finish a song. Why? Why? You don't have to do anything. You're choosing to put that kind of effort and energy into it. Does that mean don't put place your uh, your you know 100% into what you do? Absolutely no. not. No, that's not what it means. But what we're talking about is allow yourself to say no, you know, and give yourself time blocks. Give yourself the ability to say I'm going to work on this for this much and I'm going to stop. Because believe it or not, time the secret to time management is not finishing things. That's one of the first lessons that you you taught me like when we you know, we first started uh, connecting is that, uh, you know, it's if you set up time blocks and you're, you start multiple things, you know, you know, yeah, roughly around the same time, you're able to get more things done because you're more things started, more things started. Well, you're sorry, you're allowed, you're able to accomplish more things because you're, yeah. you're not allowing one specific thing. You're not allowing things to control you. You are taking back that control. Yeah, correct. And, and then that's the thing, like, if you start, which is, by the way, the hardest thing to do is to start. If you start doing several things, because if you, if you, let's say you give yourself five hours a day where you're going to just work on your career, that's five separate things you get to work on. There might be multiple things within those each hour of those things for that specific thing. But you're ultimately working on that particular general thing, be it a. Uh, Let's work on this movie. Let's. What do we need to do to make this movie happen? All right, let's write out the SMART goals. All right, let's just start at the top or let's see what SMART goal we could work on. And maybe it's uh, I have to do follow-ups. All right, well, you know, I know that I can reasonably follow up with whoever I want. Let's just take three people and work with them for this hour. You know, and you start, you start realizing when you have that kind of control over things, it's not about finishing it because they will get done. If you do a little every day, a lot will get done, right? Okay, so uh, next is uh, management of money. Okay, budget your money the same way you budget your time. Controlling your money allows you to use money instead of needing it. Same thing with time. Ooh. If you allow, if you control your money, your time, you will you will be able to use your time wisely instead of allowing things to control your time. The same thing with money. If you're in a situation where you need to do something to make money to pay a bill. You're not in control. You're not making that choice. You you think you are because you're like, oh, well, I'm choosing to do this crappy thing to make money to pay for my bills. But if you can say no to things again with money, like, for example, we talk about this all the time. If you're a female actress and you don't want to do nudity and you're like, but I'm just trying to get into the acting business and I have no money and this job pays five thousand dollars. I'm going to do it even though I'm it's a fully nude scene and like uh -huh. now you now you're not in control. Yeah, you're letting that thing and your need for money <clears throat> to uh dictate 
your yes or no. That's right. So you have to learn to budget your money. You have to learn to live within a budgeted average monthly overhead. You have to learn to control your spending habits. You got to let your needs be supplied and not your wants. Your wants you earn as you find that as you organize your money to a point where you have at least 18 months or two years in the bank, you can start now uh, uh, compressing that and say, all right, I have 18 months of, uh, you know, $2,000 a month, average monthly overhead, but I want to increase my overhead. I want, I want to have $2,500. So now you take $2,500 and you multiply that by, I mean, uh, you divide, uh, your eight, your total 18 months worth by $2,500. And then that'll bring you down to how many months you can survive on. And then once you hit that 18 months again, now you can say, Oh, maybe, maybe I want to raise it a little bit more. And then you do it again. All right. I want to live off of $2,700 a month, $2,700 divided by whatever your total 18 months is. And then you just keep going and going. You keep doing it. And as long as you can maintain that you're in top. Now, if the money starts getting lower, the most important thing you could do is cut stuff out. Things are not important. Listen, sometimes you got to cut out those extra calories. Look, you need food, air, shelter, and love. Okay. And pizza. <laughs> and pizza. Pizza, I don't actually budget. I just eat pizza. Uh, <laughs> you know, so there has to come a point where you're like, I don't need this car. I need a car. I don't need this house. I need a house. I don't need this phone. I need a phone. You know, like there is. I don't need these shoes. I need. A shoes. Yeah, I need I need a <laughs> I don't need this pair of shoes. I need a pair of shoes. And being a, being in that control is making you in control of money and not things in control of you. And finally, with management of time, money and people, people are great in life, but the right people add value. So obviously, you want your friends and stuff in your life, but the right people that you build and cultivate relationships with will add value to your life. And that value again comes in the shape of habits, influence knowledge wisdom you know things like that because the five people you spend the most time with become your world so if i'm surrounding myself with like-minded successful actors or musicians or writers or whatever i'm assuming you mean this metaphorically and not like terry pratchett with like the elephants on top of the turtle right <laughs> <laughs> one second let me, let me look up how to poison someone secretly <laughs> Hey, where do you get that little fancy poison ring? <laughs> oh, this thing? <laughs> How's you your coffee? Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, so that's what I was uh, the five people you spend the most time with become your world. And keep that in mind when you're building, cultivating your circle of influence. You know, if you want to be a successful actor, hang out with successful actors. What does that mean, though? Again, if you could define what your version of success is, that's going to be the definition you place on other people. So if other people are doing what it is that you define success as, you will ultimately be able to learn from those people, even if you don't ask. Just watch them. Just be around them. You know, when they do things, you know, volunteer time. Hey, you want me to help you? Uh, you know, I'll just whatever you need. I'll just be an extra hand. You don't have to pay me. And the re and how do we have that freedom? Well, controlling your money, you know, like setting a foundation, you know, your capital investment into your career. So, so all all of your necessities, your your uh, your bills are taken care of. So you have the freedom to just say yes to opportunity. And That's right. Yeah. Live and learn. You you got to live. Live and let die. Look at JD. Look at him. So cute. So cute. Look at him. You know, if I was gay, I would totally, totally not date you. Oh. All right. Well, it's, it's only because if I was gay, I'd be a lesbian. All right. So next is entrepreneurial brain. JD, what is entrepreneurial brain? Uh, being able to uh, think outside the box to find solutions. In any other way? or just? Uh, I don't know the rest of the definition. All right. <laughs> but, but give me an example of entrepreneurial brain. Uh, entrepreneurial brain, uh, I suppose, would be... Uh, finding uh, finding ways to make yeses happen and not necessarily accept nos or excuses for any. Well, create thing. a scenario and then then entrepreneur will bring it. All right. Uh, well, let's say like we're making a movie, an independent film. Okay. Uh, there is a specific budget. Uh, we don't have the budget, so we have to find a way to get said budget. Okay. Okay. What if you can't get the budget? Ooh. 
What if it's some idiots who want to make an independent film and they think it's the greatest film since sliced bread. So the budget is $10 million, <laughs> which by the way, is not a lot of money in the, in the feature film world of, of studios. But let's say the budget is $10 million for your first film. You have no context in the industry. What's the solution? Uh, we could potentially do a revi- uh, an overview of the, the actual budget to make sure that these uh, gung ho cowboys actually have a, a legit budget. <laughs> <laughs> we want ten million dollars. No, just... it's a ten million dollar budget. Oh, uh, so it's not just two guys in a room there asking yeah, for ten. Yeah, but million. it's a movie that takes place in space. There's uh, aliens. Sold already. There's uh, whatever you know, it is. War. There's special effects. Everything that costs money is going to be in this film. Well, at that point, you would have to come up with an entire uh, business plan for the. Well, the... you should already have that, which would include the budget. The budget, but you can't get that budget. So what do you, what is what does an entrepreneurial brain do? Mm. so when you say we can't get the budget you're saying that we can't get the budget from invest private investors or going to say no matter what you do you're not going to get that 10 million dollars you guys have zero clout uh no one trusts you people (laughs) what do you mean you people you people with 10 million dollars i suppose there's always the crowdfunding route or is that (laughs) is that you cannot get the 10 million dollars also, even if you did, you could not make that $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> this, this movie sounds like the best movie ever, and yeah. I already believe in it. All right. What, is, what, what would an entre- entrepreneurial brain do? Since entrepreneurial brain is finding solutions by thinking outside a box in a proactive effort. Oh, if no one believes in us, the issue would be that no, we would no have... one believes in you people. It, yeah, so I, It's not it, the project. You said yeah. no one believes in this. No, I said in us. Oh, oh yeah, us. Okay, okay. Yeah. No, okay. no one believes in us. The issue would be trying to uh, build relationships and opportunities so that, and show that we are people of value. How do you do that? Well, definitely start giving of our time a lot more and showing that, you know, lending a hand and helping out when and where we can to show that we do have value and that we are not just a bunch of cowboys with a space alien cowboy movie. Does value show that you deserve $10 million? It does not. How do you show that you deserve $10 million? Uh, by showing that we are capable in our what we do and that we are able oh. to uh, bring back a return on whatever it is that we are how do you do that by helping people not not uh <laughs> not specifically i don't know how do you do it i don't know i know you don't know <laughs> that's why i asked you <laughs> well then i am ending my answer here because right. it's just going to be a lot more i don't know there are there are probably a hundred different variables that you can create uh success with in this situation as an entrepreneurial brain the first Ooh. one is obviously you can just say, well, what what is the thematic aspect of this film, and where where do we think quality ends uh, and and uh, crap begins? So you could bring the film down to a to a quality that isn't necessarily the film you see on the screen. Like for example, it's in space, but does that mean we actually have to show space? Right, mm. right. It, it's in certain sets. Does that mean the sets have to be built and futuristic? Can we can we dress up? Um, the desert. Can we dress up the desert, right? Like so. they do in a lot of sci-fi movies that involve other planets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say after you do that, you still you still would have like a, a $5 million budget. And again, mm-hmm. no one's going to give you $5 million because you have no evidence. So what you do is this film is not the film for you. And that's okay. If an entrepreneurial brain doesn't feel like they have to do the thing that they want to do, they find, how do I get that thing done? So what you do is you go back and you say, what projects can I afford money to, to film? What can I get money? Like if, if I have a, a, a $10,000 film, right, and I could get money for that, and I have a plan that I know I could bring back $20,000, I just made back my money. Plus, plus I doubled it. That is the first evidence of proof that I can double my money. So now what do I got to do? Now I know I could probably get away with a twelve or $15,000 movie, right? Because I just brought back double. So that means if I do another movie, most likely I could either bring back another twenty k, or if, if I learn from what I was doing the first time, I might be able to bring back thirty k or forty k. And what you do is you do projects within your variables. What is it you can control and how can you guarantee money back? Like bands, bands do it the same. They, they don't realize that they, you know, put $10,000 into an album. They go, oh, I'll make, I'll make this money back. But you got to literally. Who, who knows you exist? 
yeah, who knows you exist? So you got to start off with little things, you know, and those little things might be shirts. Those little things might be stickers. Those are things that are affordable and don't cost you a lot. Also, everyone loves stickers for some reason. I, I wanted, I would actually be interested in finding out like the actual psychology as to why people like stickers. Because they're fun. It makes you feel like a kid. You get to slap them on your eyeball. But why do shirts have more value than a CD? Uh, because shirts can be used as a practical item. That, as... Well, a shirt is a shirt. Everyone needs a shirt. Do I like your design? That might influence if I buy it or not. I don't need to like your music. But I do like shirts. I want to wear shirts. I need more shirts. I love band shirts. Now it's a band shirt. The design is okay. Uh, I will buy, you know what I'm saying? Like you're more likely to pay for something that has a uh, uh, value to it because a CD, a movie has zero value. If I've never met you, I'm less interested. I've gone into Walmart and I said, oh, shirts. I look through the shirts and I go, I like this one. It's the same thing at a band show. They don't care about the music. They care about, do I like the shirt? You know? So you have to look at, what is the need, the demand, and how do I supply that demand? Uh, right? Bands, I think <laughs> the demand is people want good music and awesome new music. Yeah, that's but that's unique. not solving uh, a problem. A problem. Yeah. Or and, answering a question. Or answering a question. Right. So the same thing with entrepreneur brain in this situation with the film, you have to say, well, how do I solve this? Well, I know based on math, and the previous thing is, I can I, I know this many people. I know if I did this, I have this much money to market. Even if I uh, uh, put that into the budget, I can get back this much money on our return. So that means our film could be this much. Even if it's a short film, like a 10 minutes film, and it's going to cost you 8 million. I Wait, mean, 8,000, 8,000, right? So if an that's eight, a really expensive, <laughs> that was too expensive. an $8,000 film, if you know you can turn it around and, and make money off of it, be it, you know, get together with other short films and do like a nice little festival and charge people, you know, $20 to come and see, you know, five short films, mm. you know, and that's, that's an hour and it's two hours of their time or whatever the case may be, you know? So you have to, uh, you have to, that's what an entrepreneur or brain does. It, it, sometimes you can't do something, but that doesn't mean you can't do something. And you have to find a way to lead up to that. So everything you do will lead to opportunity. So what you're basically you're <clears> saying is like, just because you can't get something done right now, you can do other things that will eventually lead you to be able to get that thing done. Yeah. You, you, that's you, why you you know, Spider-Man took 20 years. Yeah, that's right. You have to recalculate your path, you know? And again, if we did say, well, the movie's 10 million, and then I was able to get it down to 5 million, I still can't get this film made. Now we have to continue to find solutions. And a lot of people become emotionally attached to the idea that they have. And they're like, this has to get done. You know, um, like, for example, you know, you're working on an album. I'm working on an album. To me, I don't even care if anyone ever hears the album. Right. Like, I, I'm going to release it because I'm going to release it. But and I, you're going to record it because you just want to record it. Because I just want to record it. Right. However, you know. Why am I making an album? <laughs> You're doing it for you. I know, but like, you know, if you think about it, why don't I just, I want to record it. You know what? I want to write a song. I'm going to record it. I don't need seven songs to associate to that song, you know? And uh, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, the entrepreneurial brain, the artist brain is like, oh, I need to have a package. I need to have seven songs together, you know? And, and like, boom. But and you, you're like, meh, here's a song. Here's a, here's a song. And then, you know, it's another reason I just released like me just playing acoustic and singing. Like, it doesn't have to be this great grand production. It just it is what it is. And it's, you know, uh, <clears throat> I know I don't make enough money with the return of effort, but myself is fulfilled. And that's why I don't put any energy into making money with music, because I know I know for a fact movies, mu music, comedy, like the performance results of anything will never make you money. If I really wanted to make money in the music industry, I would go back into that field. I would go back into bringing awareness to who I am and not necessarily the things I have. Same thing with acting. You know, like before the pandemic, I grew a very strong relationship, uh, multiple relationships within the film industry. And it was creating movement for things. In fact, the only reason the circle got anywhere is because of a relationship with somebody out there. Yeah. Um, the only reason uh, another show, Laundry, got anywhere was because of a relationship yeah. with somebody. You know, that's, that's Laundry. That was way back when you got you and I first. Uh, first, yeah, when you first started working on it. No, no, Laundry. I worked on the I the first script I ever written was Laundry. 
Was that literally like the very first script? The very ever? first, because I did it as a as exercise. I wanted to see if uh. I could write a script up, and I wrote in two thousand nine. And uh, one of my friends who was going to school for script writing mm-hmm. looked at the script and said, "This is terrible. No one will ever be interested in this." <laughs> The same script that they said was terrible was the script that I, I did not edit it. <laughs> you did not change anything. I just handed it in and they were like, uh, do you have more? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I have more scripts. And they didn't realize every script I handed in after that, I was writing basically over the course of a week. And they're like, oh my God. And they thought I had been working the scripts. And I was like, no, these are first drafts. And they're like, what? These these are great. That's really funny. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because Jeez, have I, really, I met you, what, 2012? 13. Jeez. Because 2009 to 2010. I've literally almost known you for a decade. Yeah, because uh, maybe 12. No, no. You, I you moved. came you came 2013 because I was in the theater in 2012. Yeah, because I moved in 2014. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you came after Liars and Lovers. I don't I even think you is. you didn't even see Letter of Reason, right? You didn't see my production of it. No. So you didn't even know me. Until, and that was... Uh, Letter of Reason was the December show of our first year, and then January, like that following year. All right. uh, yeah, not like that. Anyway, no matter. Uh, also, entrepreneurial brain. Remember, you are only as great as your yes. Mm-hmm. A strong entrepreneurial brain finds yeses. And remember, if I can't get this film made, how do I find my yes? I have to reorganize. I have to. I I can step back. And lower the bar to a to a higher position for something less, you know. Even though you should always be hiring the bar, well, sometimes you put it too high, <laughs> and you're like, "All right, let me bring it down so I can actually reach the bar." Yeah, let me reach the bar, which will be my best at this moment, and I'll be able to work to get higher and higher. Especially if you're uh, vertically challenged like me. Yeah, yeah, you, you're not that short for a tiny person, but uh, I'm the littlest giant. He is the littlest <laughs> giant. He likes sometimes I walk in his room and he has like all these dolls set up. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm the green giant. And I'll like, be painted green. And then I would slowly shut the door <laughs> to the insane asylum. Um, uh, finally, the end result is to influence all aspects of your life. Artists seek the conclusion of their idea, whereas entrepreneurial brains seek the influence of their ideas. What does that mean, JD? Hmm. Uh, I, I guess that means that the artists are looking for the satisfaction of whatever it is brings, like brings them a result. Whereas the entrepreneurial brain is looking for how is this going to affect uh, the world around me. Well, specifically your world. But as an example, if you release your album, what is the point to that? And you uh, can't say to build brand value. As an artist, it is for self satisfaction. Because you're like, oh, look at me. Look what I did. All right. Let's say an artist that thinks uh, they're going to make money. Why Why are they releasing the album? Oh, uh, an artist thinks that they're going to make money because they've released something. And if they built it, people will automatically come because it's amazing, awesome, and unique. Yeah. When Metallica makes an album. They've <laughs> earned the right to they, make an album. Yeah. They earned the right to make an album. And their as album, terrible as anger they is. use to do other things. For example, some kind of monster that was basically a documentary on St. Anchor. Right and Saint Anchor, <laughs> Saint Anchor, because it sank to the bottom. Yeah, definitely, definitely sink, sink, sink. Anchor. What's crazy is that Saint Anchor is such a terrible album, but like record sales wise, it still like did like because it's Metallica. That's it. Uh, Their core fans bought it, and then we're like, mm. uh, anyway. My point is, they use that album to justify growth to their not just their brand value, but growth to their opportunities, growth to their. Uh, their reach, and they op- they started uh, docu- the film. They, yeah, which, things- by the way, I, I just sidestepping a little bit. I really, really, really like that documentary. Some some kind of monster. Just not not because it gives, not just because it gives uh, a look behind the scenes of what it's like to make the album, the whole process, and like the band dynamic. But like just because you know, like it was such a a vulnerable point that just happened to be going through, like you know, James going through like rehab and everything. Like mm-hmm. I, I think it takes a lot of. Uh, takes a lot of strength and a lot of chutzpah bringing, <laughs> bringing back the word to you know put that out there bring him bring him back uh you know uh one of my favorite parts is when um Kurt and Hammond's like what do you what do you mean no solos <laughs> people when people listen to the, the metallica they, they they want guitar solos we're not gonna can we at least try one 
<laughs> no. They did. They tried one, and then, then they took it. They didn't have any solos in that album. Yeah. I feel That's like that, al- that album has, like, good moments that if they were, like, fleshed out and, like... Oh, yeah, totally. Anyway. <laughs> and also a different snare. If if it was a completely different band made that that album, it would still be terrible. It would be a good album. <laughs> uh, the end result is to influence all aspects of your life. Artists seek the conclusion of their idea. Entrepreneurial brains seek the influence of their ideas. What that means is everything you do must affect everything you do. An artist's brain, and I'm not just saying artists, but an artist's brain says, I have this product. It needs to get finished. I'm going to show it to everybody. And that's their goal. How do I get it out? How do I make money on it? How do I get the most people to see it? Entrepreneurial brains think if I make a CD or a movie or a, or a comedy special or I write a book or whatever the case may be, how does this influence my overall mission, my business plan? How does this movie help the next movie I make? How does this album help the next album? How does this album help my tour? How does the album help my interviews? How does this album help people get to know who I am more? How do I use the creation of what I'm doing to build awareness? How do I, you know, instead of just the thing, like, how do I get people to know that this album is existing so I could sell the album? Like, if that's you, not you're using smart. that as an excuse to connect with people instead of just using it as yeah. like, give me your money. Give me, give me your money, bitch. <clears throat> Philip right. Fry. Shut up and take my money. Take my money. All right, talent. Okay. Now, obviously, uh, JD has nothing to add to this, so we're yeah, just gonna. Uh, I'm terrible at everything. <laughs> what Except is talent for this? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Quick, call a doctor. All right. What is talent? Uh, I am going to assume talent is, you know, how well you, you can do something. I try to get JD to talk a little bit, and it just never works. Let's go back. To, Listen, I'm I'm me, a, I'm a quiet. This. I'm a mute. Talent is what you bring to the table. Ooh. Talent could be your craft, but it doesn't necessarily have to be your craft. But talent is your overall. What do you bring to the table, right? Uh, but it's more importantly, it's your talent within and outside of your business, your industry. Okay, it's how well you understand what it is you do and what you can bring to what it is you do. And that could be anything from when I play with a band, what else do I bring to this table? Just my guitar playing? Or am I bringing marketing expertise? Am I bringing networking expertise? Am I money management? Do I, uh, you know, am I an artist? Do I have graphic design ability? What is it I'm bringing to the table beyond the fact that I can do something? If you're an actor in a film and you're just there to act, I'm just, uh, I just got hired to say my lines. Like, then, I'm not really going to market this. And if I am, I'm just going to tell people I'm in it. You're, you're, you're not bringing anything to the table. Yeah, because you're just there to, quote, unquote, do a job. It's the same thing. You're yeah. just going to an office job <laughs> exactly. and then leaving. To get your paycheck. You, you'll let people know you're there. Hey, boss, uh, I, I, I clocked in. I did my work. I'll see you Friday for my paycheck. That is, you're not bringing anything to the table other than you the bare can, minimum. Yeah, you could do what you do. So you add zero value beyond your task ability. Anyone can be a puppet. Anyone could be a robot. Anyone could just come in and go, I'm going to do this. It will be finished. I'll collect check. But if you add value, if you if you bring more to the table, if you bring if you bring uh, a little bit of extra pepper, as they say, pepper. Somebody says I'm sure. I say it all the time. You have to bring the pepper. Uh, <laughs> bring, <laughs> bring bring the pepper. Bring the pepper. So your talent is what do you bring to the table? You got to know the talent of how much you know of your business, your industry. And outside your industry, you don't have to be an expertise in anything. You just have to be aware of your skill in that level. And then so you're saying, like, be able to do your say we're in entertainment. So yeah. Be 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 good at the entertaining and the entertainments, but also maybe have a little bit of information on like astrophysics. Is that what you're saying? No, no. If 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 I uh, if, if let's say I'm an actor and I'm in the acting business, I should also know a little bit about how the law works and the accounting works within that field. Ah. So law is outside my field, but it's the, the connection to the, the adjacent is, of the field. Yeah. 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 So we don't have to necessarily know astrophysics. I mean, you can, because again, what do you bring to the table? Right. So you I know. know how to make this show out of this world. Do you, do you need <laughs> to take a break? <laughs> All right. Uh, talent also, when in any situation, 
how valuable you are invests into your brand's value. So when you are in a situation, if you're just, let's say, an actor or an actress, and you're just doing your part, you're like, I said my lines, I'll be in my trailer. All right, they need me, I do my lines, I go back in my trailer. You're not bringing value, and nothing is being invested back into you. Just being great at acting doesn't make you valuable. And your brand is not growing because of it, because they're just going to know you as you're really good at what you do, but that's all I'm going to get. All right? So... Another thing is like if you're an actor or a performer and you're part of a project, a band, a movie, whatever, if you have amazing interview skills, now you are a performer and you have good interview skills. If you're a performer, have good interview skills, but also you really know how to market your social media. Now your talent is bringing to the table. You're going to perform even at bare minimum, by the way. You don't have to be the greatest performer to get work. Trust me on that. I'm sure you've seen things and said, how the hell did they to get that job? Like me. <laughs> right? So now you have three things you're bringing to the table. They know if they hire you, you're going to be good at the job they hired you for. You're going to be good at doing the interviews to bring awareness. And you're going to be good at marketing on your social media. So those are just, that's just three examples. But we're now, now what about, you know what? I also, I'm, I'm really good at understanding how a camera works, not necessarily how to take photo, not, not how a camera works per se, but but how to work with the camera. Yeah, and you learn that skill by studying basically photography or studying cinematography. And now, what does that mean? Hey, what's my what's my framing? Where's my movement? You know, am I in one of the uh, nine spot? You know, the nine boxes. Where am I in the crosshairs? You know, and you start being able to work with the cinematographer or the or the DP uh, or the director, and you say, you know, what are you looking for? This are you looking for a, a, a cross pan? Are you looking for? Do you want me to be in the foreground or the background? And knowing these terminologies are good, but also how to utilize that knowledge is of value. It so, shows that you're a team player and you're, you're able to help make the entire that's right uh, process move quicker and smoother and more efficiently. Yeah. Always, always put time into knowing your industry, even at, at just a little bit, a minimum of how things work in your industry. Don't just be, I'm amazing at what I do. I'm a good guitarist. I'm a good bass player. I'm a good actor, a good comedian. Like none of that. You will Who not cares? have, you won't have longevity. You will have success, 15 minutes, and then your longevity won't be there. Okay, because everyone be like, we don't want to work with this guy. Well, no, you you. If it came down to like you being a uh, subpar actor, but you have all these other talents that you bring value to a project, versus say an actor who is amazing, uh, actor, amazing, but just that's all they can do. Yeah, yeah. You know, people are gonna want to work with the person that's able to, you Br know, yeah, be a work. part of the team. Yeah. yeah, not just like they're there. Yeah, what do you bring to the table? Uh, I'm really good at reading these lines, and also great papan. <laughs> Got to one. Uh, finally, with talent, be more than your craft. Uh, people in the entertainment of in uh, the in entertainment industry believe their craft is the key to their success and the key to their longevity. Uh, you have to be good. You have to always be getting better. But you don't have to be amazing, awesome, or unique. You just need to be able to perform with your craft. But if you focus solely on your craft, your career will fail. You need to build outside avenues. You need to build value with what you are capable of bringing to the table. And this goes back to the practice aspect is know your strengths and weaknesses. And if you come into a situation where you don't understand what's going on in the room, wherever you are, learn. Put some time into learning. Have you ever been in a studio and they start talking about certain things and you're just like, well, when do I record? You know, like, did you hit the record button? I don't know what you guys are talking about. What's the difference between those microphones? Like, yeah, when I first started off, I was just like, that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, do I record yet? We're gonna, we're gonna use SM57. Oh, okay. <laughs> is that uh, is that does that have lights on? Yeah. It? Is it is it the gold microphone? It no. <laughs> is it a blue microphone? I kind of no. I kind of want to get an SM57 just like a painted gold now. And <laughs> why is why is it gold? I mean, why not? I mean, it, now it's all fancy. I brought my own microphone. Uh, that's a that's a vocal mic. Yeah, but I want to use it on my guitar. It's gonna sound cool. Yeah, okay, when, when, when don't you go inside? I'll set it up. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want the mic? No, no, just go inside. No, they, they take the mic, just put it on a stand, just don't plug it into anything. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, I didn't know my mic was wireless. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Anyway, all right, let's keep going. Let's keep oh, going. God. All right, That's so funny. now we're up to three needs of purpose. So we did uh, three needs of success, which leads you to success. Three needs of longevity, which leads you to a, uh, a a prosperous longevity in your career. And now the three needs of purpose. This is all based. Three needs of purpose is designed to fuel your purpose. And how do we fuel a purpose, JD? Uh, with money. With money. That's right. With money. All right. Definitely now, not gasoline. You want to organize your money. And once you organize your money, there will be areas that you're able to um, implement that organization, uh, the surplus of being able to organize money, and then place it into your three needs of purpose, security, growth, and dream. Ooh, security protects you, growth invests in you, and dream rewards you. Now, of and course, we're going to Disneyland. We're going to Disneyland. Now, there should also be an emergency fund, which is outside of this. An emergency fund is a little different than a security security is to protect you in the sense of in case you are dead broke dead broke all your money's gone your business has failed you have no money you can literally use this money to start over an emergency is like you your car broke down yeah and you're like oh, i gotta fix my car yeah you don't want to use your own overhead money for that and you don't want to use your security for that security you do not touch until you're broke but you always fuel your security you're so, always putting money into it so you always have that safety net yeah, but but the emergency fund is different than your three needs of purpose. Your emergency fund does not fuel your purpose. And why security fuels your purpose and emergency fund doesn't? The security is your capital investment to start over, whereas your emergency fund is to protect you if something goes wrong. Those are two different things. Emergency fund will not help you fuel so something. So the security is the emergency fund for the emergency fund. <laughs> the security is the emergency fund for... <laughs> for the a, emergency fund. For, no no the security is actually to protect you so you can take chances because if your chances at succeeding fail you have this to fall back on gotcha. because you want to be able to take chances and be able to say yes and no to things and the reason is because security protects yourself to allow for those choices because choice is the freedom of life if I have the ability to make choices knowing I have something to fall back on I can confidently make those choices knowing, you know, that I'm not going to be in dire straits if like, oh, no, I, I, I failed. I'm broke. Right. I know and, that bad. and fair and having that fear to make choices will keep you from making. choices. Remember earlier I said the hardest thing to do is to do to start. Mm -hmm. So if you have security protecting you saved up, you can make strong choices even if you fail because, you know, you have something to fall back on. But additionally, Security is definitely there not to be touched until you have zero dollars. All right. So in theory, you should just have the, the security and never have to touch it. Yeah. One day you'll die. <laughs> and then you and can it'll leave it still to be dog. there. Yeah. You could give it, give it to <laughs> your dog. Uh, growth. Growth is ultimately invest to create passive income because wealth is the amount of time you can go without having to recoup income. If you can take your money, that is not your, your, overhead organized money like the money you live off of and you can create the growth need you can create assets will ultimately will fuel back into your foundation your, which supplies your safety net and also fuel back into your three needs of purpose and also supply your emergency fund mm -hmm. because you basically create dividends from your assets you say all right my assets made me this much that means i could take this much refuel into that and then as your growth need allocate certain amount of money you can start investing into assets because assets grow you wealth liabilities cost you money all right two different two different things and of course finally dream the dream is about rewarding yourself for all your hard work you earn it don't spend it what does that mean uh that means that you have to literally earn the right to treat yourself to do something that you want so let's say you want to go on vacation you have to earn the right so you have to earn that you know within your account you want you actually want to go to disneyland wait make sure you can afford do, to do so with your dream account yeah because if you go to disney world before you have earned the right because there's money in the dream the dream need and you're spending money that's in your foundation account which ultimately pays for your you're messing up you're messing up because when you come back home what's going to happen you're going to be like oh crap i gotta go work now yeah, I need to, I need to replenish recoup. that. Uh, so allow your dream need to award uh, reward you when it is allocated to the right amount. The other thing is our wants must be the result of smart business. So dream Ooh. account allows you to organize your money in a way that 
oh, they, I want a new, I want a very sp specific car. Well, I have the money that will afford that. Also, if you have an asset, the asset itself can be designed to pay for that car. Like, let's say I want a specific car and I have a business. I can actually take an asset that's making money that is a business and make the car purchase a company car. Ooh. <laughs> now it's a write on, right? But the company pays for that car. <clears throat> now, how do you. That is very smart. That is very smart. How do you organize your three needs of purpose? Ultimately, like we said earlier, you should have a foundation that you start your career with. Don't just jump into a career. You should have up to 18 months of an average monthly overhead. So, for example, this is an arbitrary number. Please don't live off of this number. I'm just doing it for easy math. If your overhead, your monthly average overhead was $1,000, your startup capital for 18 months would be $18,000. $18,000. If you have $18,000, you can now, in this situation, jump off into your career, and you can quit your job and just focus on building your career. Because you don't have to worry about anything for 18 months. For 18 months, minimum. Uh, additionally, what you do is you create a safety net uh, a numerical safety net for this 18 months. Let's say it's going to be if I if my foundation reaches three months, I hit my safety net threshold <clears throat> and now I got to start trying to get money back in there. Um, however, as long as your foundation is over those three months, every dollar you make gets to be organized into your three needs of purpose. So what you do is it's called 60 40 split. All right. So any dollar you make over your three months safety net, you'll divide, let's say you made $100, mm -hmm. you divide it 60-40. So 40% 40 of that, which is $40, goes back into your foundation. And the reason we do that is because we want to always keep growing your foundation so it doesn't go under your, your, your safety net threshold, right? And then the other 60%, we divide evenly into security, growth, and dream. However, if you're trying to build your emergency fund too, what you can do is in the beginning, allow that 60% to go all in to your emergency fund until you reach $2,000, because that's a pretty good emergency fund, $2,000, unless you feel it should be more. If you feel it should be more, let it grow a little bit more until you get to a number. You have to decide what that number is. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Like, what? How much is a broken femur? Yeah, $2,000 is a good start. $1,000 is a great start. It doesn't matter. Once you have that, now you can start taking that 60% and start putting that, divide that evenly into your security growth and dreams so they rise. Once you hit a certain number in your security growth and dream, now you would take that 60% and you would divide it by four. And you would put money into emergency fund, security, growth, and dream. So now you're supplying all those. But the reason you build your emergency fund first is because if anything goes wrong, you have an emergency fund. Yeah. So you want to have that money. Uh, and then but once the security reaches a certain point, now you now you now you have a machine working. You have your, your like, stuff this working. is really nice. So that's really that's how you do it. And you just keep doing that and doing that and doing that. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to just kind of like glaze over this next one because I, I could literally sit on eight assets of life for like days. So are there donuts <clears throat> involved since we're glazing? Absolutely. You, you can take a break. Uh, <laughs> so a quick rundown of the eight assets of life. JD, what are they? Uh, let's see what I remember. You ready? Oh, ready? Jesus. ready? How ready? long have you been <laughs> learning this? Uh, we have intellectual properties. We have IOUs. Can you say them in order? Uh, no. Order of value? No. I don't know them in the order of value. Tell me what the first, the two to five months uh, column is. <clears throat> uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Yeah, and uh, IOUs. No, I don't know. You said it earlier. Mu uh, intellectual property. That's right. So go ahead, say that. Stock, again. bonds, mutual funds, intellectual properties. Okay, now what is your six to ten year investments? Uh, IOUs. Uh, that's real, in real estate. Real estate is the first one. Real estate. Yeah. It, then is it IOUs? No, businesses. Uh, businesses. Uh huh. And then IOUs. That's right. <laughs> Woohoo! And then, uh, coffee, gold, wheat. Oh, uh, what the hell? They they call it the <clears throat> commodities. Commodities. All right. We, for, uh, we forgot adult films, <laughs> which is a IOU. I mean, <laughs> uh, so. Oh dear God. Assets just to run those. Those are the eight assets of life: stocks, bonds, mutual funds, intellectual properties, uh, real estate, business, IOUs, and commodities. Once your uh, your growth need and your three needs of purpose is allocated enough, you would start investing ultimately into the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and intellectual properties. If you notice, it's the first two to five years, and the reason you do that 
as it goes over the course of your first year of starting your career, you have that 18 months to live off of. So a, you're going to put money into it. I have a question being that we're on the stock bonds and mutual what? funds because I feel like this might be a question that people might be asking uh, uh, when they listen to this later on. Uh, uh, where would uh, cryptocurrencies fall within that or would they not fall within stocks? It would be stocks. Yeah. Even, even though they're because you're buying stock in that currency. Yeah. You're putting stock into that. You're saying, oh, I, I believe. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not just, yeah. Uh, you know, chicken stock. Yeah, cryptocurrency is outside my uh, my area of expertise when it comes to investing, only because. You haven't done enough research on yeah, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I bought Dogecoin because it was a joke and I just worked out. <laughs> but Warren Buffett even said he's, he's missed out on uh, extremes amount of money. In investment opportunities because he didn't understand yeah and he do he refused so, to take the risk yeah and that's an important aspect of entrepreneurial brain is being aware of what you can afford to lose but uh on the other hand warren buffett's you know <laughs> one stock of his company is worth three hundred and forty thousand dollars. yeah so he's okay so, <laughs> so oh, no i missed out on bitcoin yeah oh, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> 40, 000, 40 but the, but the idea is that you're investing uh stocks bonds mutual funds and creating intellectual properties which by the way are just copyrights trademarks and patents and you're developing these things be and ultimately the money you make from that would go back into fueling your purpose which ultimately should allow you to have more money in your growth asset your growth need, I mean, uh, which allow you to start uh, real estate, you know, uh, opening up, creating real estate opportunities. And then that real estate opportunity should help you open up more businesses or vice versa, you know, open up the businesses, whatever. Anyway, I didn't really want to get into eight, eight assets, but you need them to develop wealth. Because the more, the less you have to uh, recoup, you know, you know, yeah. the better, more time you have to actually take control over your life and be your own boss. Yeah. And believe it or not, buying a house or property or like a multi home is not as uh, expensive as you think it is. Especially there's also a lot of uh, state and uh, government grants if you're in the U.S. Uh, speaking that are and, all over the place. Yeah. There's a lot of them are just grants that, you, you know, you potentially don't even have to pay back. So there's yeah. a <clears throat> buttload of free money out there. Definitely do your research, but even but even beyond the grants, which basically would pay for your your uh, your closing costs or like your down payments, even beyond the grants, let's say that you know all you, you need is you need uh, three to ten percent. If you have twenty percent, you don't have to do a credit check. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I do now. Yeah, so three to ten percent is a really good start. And if you're looking at a house or a multiplex, which by the way you can find a multiplex for two hundred thousand dollars or less or less, you know twenty grand. And that's a good investment because if you get a multi house and there's three apartments or four apartments, even if you don't live in one of them and they each bring in a thousand dollars, well, depending on where you are or depending on where you are, you know, uh, you're going to it's a good it's a good return on your investment. Trust me. <laughs> yes. You know, but it, we, we could literally get into this for days. Uh, I want to move on to the last subject so we can close the show. The last know. subject is my favorite is subject open? is treat your life like a business. J.D., what does that mean? Uh, it means that you should literally do just that. You should treat your life like a business. You should make sure that you're uh, you're making sure that all sides of the triangle are equally getting the attention that they, mm -hmm. they that they need. You're being responsible. Yeah. You're not just kind of like you know lounging around and being lazy and waiting for opportunity. You're being proactive. Being proactive is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and also, if you were running a business and not walking a business, not walking. If you were running a business and that business is being taken care of differently than your life. You are not running your life like a business. Or if you run your business like you run your life, your business will fail. And the reason is because you need to create caps. You need to create uh, purpose, rules, standards, uh, and you got to abide by those rules. You got to abide by the value of what it takes to do what it is you want to do, right? And one of those things you should really focus on is paying your business first, like JD and I. Every dollar we make for BBR, we just throw into the BBR account. And then we say, hey, let's pay the bills, right? And that pays the bills. Let's pay ourselves this much money. But most bands do this. They make $100 at a gig. And, and then they what do they do? Themselves. Yeah, the they band do. has no money. Or all they do, this, my, this is my favorite. They go, okay, there's four of us and then the band bank account. So uh, let's divide it by five. And then you're like, no. Put all the money into the, into the business Yeah, so that the business can afford to run itself so you don't ever have to put your yeah. own money into the business the goal is that the business account grows so much that eventually it affords the living method and if you're young enough or old enough it doesn't matter and you're starting a band 
You guys should all, or girls too, man, you should live together. Get a house or an apartment. Do the Metallica. Do the Metallica. Live on the small, sacrifice every successful story in this world. Invest in bug spray. Sacrificed. Literally every, Elon Musk with his brother lived in a small office and started a uh, uh, PayPal. Elon Musk. One of the wealthiest, <laughs> most brilliant men on the planet. Yeah. Warren Buffett to this day lives in the same house he bought when he got married. He still goes to Wendy's and he spends $3, whatever it is, on his meal and he goes to work. This man is a multi billionaire and he still only pays, what does he pay himself, 50000 a year? Or uh, I don't remember. He pays himself almost nothing. So his business makes the money and then he pays himself a salary because he, he lives on it. Now, now, obviously, if you're Warren Buffett, you can you can increase your your budget. But in the beginning, sacrifice your wants to supply and afford your needs. And if you're in a band with five people or four people and you live in a place, your expenses have just dropped. And if you work and you buy one fifth, uh, no, by four fifths because you're splitting it with you know other people. Yeah. So you know you got to think responsibly and eventually like metallica did they and poison and motley crew and every other band out there that lived together you're going to get to the point where you can afford to not live together <laughs> and you're like thank god yeah i gotta move <laughs> lars just <laughs> farts all the time anyway oh god so uh, when to treat your life like a business you need to pay your business first i know there's a whole bunch of gurus out there and a whole bunch of people that say you gotta pay yourself before you pay your business no Pay your business and allow your business to pay you because now it's a write off. Uh, second, pay you from the business. Don't pay you from the client. If a client gives you a thousand dollars, you did not just make a thousand dollars. Your business made a thousand dollars. Made a thousand dollars. You make whatever you make. And you don't always have to take the pay. You could just say, let me get the company to a point where it's paying for my bills, paying for my living expenses, but I'm not really taking anything off the top to like buy anything fancy. It's just literally paying for my survival. Yeah, it's paying for your needs your needs and then once you start making enough money to a certain point then you can start paying yourself and that's okay in the beginning third invest back into your business allow your business to grow how do we do that well different things you know maybe get an office maybe grow you know how do how do you start allowing your business to f fund the expense that you have to have a third party you know say like you make t you say you're a Say you design T-shirts, right? And then you hire another company to do the T-shirts for you. Well, now, how about how much would it cost to have that in a shop? You just take care of it yourself. Yeah. I, can I afford to just do that? Don't don't take out credit. Don't. Yeah. don't. Make sure you can afford to do the growth, not yeah. just you know put yourself at yeah, yeah, don't do, do the thing. Yeah, don't just. If you can't afford it. Don't do it. Yeah, don't just grow to grow. You know. <clears throat> but the other thing is uh, invest back into your business. You know better equipment better better uh organize you know and remember you don't always have to get paid the most money because if your business is paying for your existence your expenses are a lot less yeah so you know at the same time if you're making a thousand dollars a month but your business is paying for all your bills just save that money <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh organize your life with these five sides remember that what are the five sides jd uh three needs of, of success oh yeah three needs of longevity uh -huh, mm -hmm. three needs of purpose Ooh, Ooh. uh which what uh, 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 uh so so close eight 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 assets of life yeah and then run your life like a business that's right so organize your life in this if you ever feel like nothing's happening look at your eight sides that we mentioned today and go five sides the five sides yeah, yeah are, are we networking are we marketing are we practicing are we growing as individuals are we finding solutions are we managing our time money and people are we utilizing our talent what are we bringing uh, what are we bringing to the table? Am I organizing my money? Am I at the point where I could organize my money? Did I create a capital foundation? Did I, did I set my, so you just look at what you're doing. And if you're not doing the things that are within the triangle or one thing is benefiting and the others are not, you have to re recalibrate your effort. You know, you got to always be doing at least a little of everything. Right. Uh, and finally, one, one of the biggest things <clears throat> about a business is grow your team okay as as whatever let's say you're a band or an actor or, or a writer or, or writer. anything a director anything you got to grow your team you can either pay them or give them equity in the bigger picture all right and part of that like so jd i brought on we we share an equity in the company right so 
Um, if, if you, if you can afford it, you hire a team. If you can't, they're part of the growth. If you're in a band, the, the, well, the problem with a band is like if the band exists and then somebody comes into the band, you know, they wouldn't have the same equal equity. So you have to really have those conversations. Say, what what are you deserving of? What what do you bring to the table? Are you just a bass player? Well, we're going to give you a point, <laughs> you know, but but what do you do? Do you what do you bring to the table? And then you figure out the worth of that. And da, 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 da. and that means they have to invest their time and money and they have to agree to the business plan. They have to agree to the business results. If you all start a business at the same time, which would be the band, you have to agree on these things. You have to create a business plan, a marketing plan. You have to create how does the equity split? Somebody has to have just one point more than everyone else so they can have the final say because indecision creates Stagnant. defeat and failure. Right? Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot involved. Now you should also have in the contract that if you leave the band at, before a certain amount of time, you have to forfeit X amount of points Ooh. because obviously if I put five years into a band and I leave, I still deserve whatever their future comings is, even yeah. if it's small, but you need those points back to give to the next person. And it really works itself out. Cause if like, you know, you come into the band you have to be in the band for X amount of time before you get your equity. You know, like, so you have to create this stuff all in advance. You can't just make it up. You have to have a plan to set that up. Same thing with a, with a production company or an acting troupe or whatever the case may be. You should all be working together. And, and how do you make the company grow? You know, um, and, it, and sometimes your company, you want to you wanna separate the points, right? So let's say there's 100 points in any company, which there would be, right? Sometimes you want to split it 50-50. And what does that mean? It means... The workers get 50% and you divide the 50% by however many workers you have, right? And then the other 50% is the business. The business itself owns that 50%. So that's why the business is always getting fueled. Always getting fueled. And you could also use that 50% for Unleaded. investors. Ooh. So if you go, hey, we want to open up something or we want to do this thing, we will give you points in the company for this much money. However, in the contract deal, you will be able to remain having those points for X amount of years to make back this much money that you gave us plus the plus the ten percent, which is normal. All right, and then you could stay you could stay on ownership with no no say for up to X amount of years. And then once those years are once you're paid back plus your ten percent plus the once that's done, now your year start and you you accumulate your four years, then we automatically get those points back. So you but you have to have these conversations. You have to set that stuff up. And I don't know many companies or people that do that. So especially like starting out, like if you're in the arts, you don't really part of the education is that there is no uh, there is almost no education in, in this aspect of everything because everyone just puts so much focus on the art side of it. And you don't really, yeah. you know, think of, oh, wait a second. I, I the, the whole idea of like a point system for, you know, equity in a band. It's like, oh, wait a second. We are a business. This is something that does apply to us. Yeah. And also, you know, <clears throat> as you know, <laughs> in bands, they break up or people leave or people get fired or, yep. you know, um, people just get tired of doing it. They're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it anymore. And, you know, that's why you have these conversations and you set these these ground rules that aren't necessarily set in stone, per se, but they at least give you like success. We talked about you have to define success for yourself so you know what you're working towards. And even in the beginning of a business, that company's business plan is going to change. Mm -hmm. It's going to. Yeah. Even your smart goals. Like the, the way you map out your one, three, five, seven, and 10 year goals. It's going to change. It's going to change. Things are going to come up and you're going to end up doing things quicker or it's going to take longer. And that's okay. We have this pressure of this must get done by this time, but that's not really the case. You, you, you just work on it. Make sure things are happening. Be proactive. Uh, but be malleable, be able to adjust. And that's part of your entrepreneurial brain. That's part of treating your life like a business is saying things don't control me. I control them. If something comes up where I have to adjust, how can I adjust that into the long scheme of things and not necessarily, well, I need my movie to come out now. I need my album to come out. I need that. You know, like if you rely on the things, you're always going to be controlled by that temptation. You know? Yeah. You're never going to have, you know, uh, yeah, like you said, you're gonna you're gonna be controlled by those things, and you're not gonna have control of your life. You know, I, I have control over my life, right? What, I don't know about you. what do you do. You do? I, don't know. I just I'm here ringing a bell. So uh, sometimes back back when I was younger, after I left the band, whatever, <clears throat> you know, I 
I live very poorly. I always have. And by poorly, you mean just on a low budget. Extreme. <laughs> Not like you're living in like a sewage dump. Yeah, I, I, I live very low. Um, and, uh, you know, people... For the, for the record, I think that's one of the reasons why you and I get along so well. Is the fact <laughs> that we are both minimalists and we're just like... I don't... Eh. Yeah. What was it? Like three months ago, I was like... I was like, I, I really, I've never owned like my own studio equipment. I've always worked for studios. My brother, yeah. you know, had studio equipment in the house. He's owned a studio. I worked with it, but I've never like had my own nice speakers. I never had my own nice microphones. I I never... think within the past, like, like you said, like three to six months when we started actually like, getting yeah. stuff, like we got these like fancy little like mic arms. You got like your, your speakers for that. You got yourself a new microphone, like a focal mic. I know, but just the idea to buy it was <laughs> so, I was filled with anxiety because like, oh, I was just like, and not that I couldn't afford, but it was like, do I want it? Should I buy it? Do I really need it? And it's like, eh, the hell with it. <laughs> <laughs> it was so hard, but as soon as I just was like, eh, I'll just get it. Like I was fine, you know. Yeah. Like I was fine, but it, like to do that, the was initial difficult. click. Oh Jesus! I was just like, and I haven't even really used it yet, but I like, I definitely, I definitely have it in my. You own it. It's officially yours. I, yeah, <laughs> it was funny when I got it. I got like an amazing mic. It's a standard in the industry. And JD's like, oh, do you want to use your new mic for the podcast? I was like, never. <laughs> <laughs> that is a vocal mic. I will not use it anywhere else other than for vocals. Well, you're talking into the vocal. Yeah, but I mean, like, this this mic is actually not meant for this. I wanted the buy. It's like $4.99 or $3.99 for really good podcast mic mm -hmm. um, that they normally use, like Joe Rogan uses. Like, it's a oh, standard yeah. for podcasts, and it's really good. You could talk into it this way, or you could talk into the top. Just... This is a vocal mic, though. This is for singing. <laughs> that's that's what this is for. Uh, but this is a lower quality. This mic compared to my new mic, you can't, even, you can't even put them together. You can't even. And this is a good mic. It's just, I mean, listen to it. You can really. You could really get that bass. <laughs> Sit I feel on like you should be doing ladies. one of those like love line like midnight radio shows. Yeah. Hello. If you have herpes, remember, spread it around on there. <laughs> <laughs> like butter. Like butter. <laughs> if you found out that you had herpes, like how would your life change? Uh, I would definitely uh, refrain from the uh, the physically touching anything. You can still have sex though, because like first of all, there's like herpes groups. Ooh. Right, where like her people with herpes date, but also I believe <laughs> if you're if you, if it's not if it's uh, herpes herpes tender, obviously I'm not, no seriously, it's a real thing. Uh, I'm not an expert in it, but uh, I think when it's there's times when it's in submission, I mean, not submission, uh, remission, remission, and I don't think you're as contagious or contagious at all. I suppose it also depends on the type of herpes. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely that, but like. Uh, but anyway, but if you had herpes, like, how would your life, like, how how would it change? I mean, I would definitely be a lot more uncomfortable. Would you actually wash your hands after you peed? <laughs> I mean, I every still... time with soap. Uh, I do that now. Every time. Every with time. Some, without fail. Without fail. Every single time. Yes, because I know if I don't. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh, so if I wasn't here, would you do it every time? Uh. Yeah. Wash my hands, yes. With, With soap. soap? Probably not. All right, ladies. He's <laughs> available for grinder. <laughs> I've always wondered why people don't do it. Like, my brain flips out when I see someone just turn on water and do this with their hands. And then they go. And then they dry it. Or they just do this. And I'm like, oh, you God, didn't wash your hands. Oh, this bothers you, but <laughs> yes, having filth on your hands. Yeah, but then you're just going to get stuff wet because you're not touching. You know, that yeah. bothers me. You know what it is? I've worked in the food industry when I was younger. And I know how sick you can get from not washing your hands. Like, it's bad, dude. I don't know if you know that. Do you not know that? I don't. I do now. You, it's it. The reason you are forced to, by law, to wash your hands is because it will mess you, you up. You, oh, yeah, you can get you can get pretty messed up. You get pretty messed up. And and the thing is, like, you're less likely to get sick from food that fell on the floor and picked back up and cooked than if you didn't wash your hands. That is crazy. It well, was a five second. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason, the reason is, is because, uh, uh, your the bacteria in your hands is different than filth. Like the dirt or whatever, you know, the bacteria of like poo or whatever, you know, is different than dirt. Like filth is filth. 
but bacteria is the that's the poison. Mm. You know, you can eat dirt. You know, you can eat dirt, right? Uh, yes. You can't eat a lot of it. You could also eat, you can you can eat dust. You can our bodies can eat a lot of things that aren't necessarily there's no nutrition in it. But bacteria messes it, you up. If it fits in your mouth, it can be. I think there's a thing where people use the coal too, right? Not coal. Uh, uh, not char charcoal. Charcoal. Like uh, I think it's like a trend. You mean? No, like uh, you know, for um, like barbecues, like that charcoal. The uh, what is that? The charcoal. Yeah, it's the people I, would eat charcoal. I think you can eat that. Yeah, let me. Let me uh, I, I don't know about that. I know, I know, like before we were like, uh, you know, Homo sapiens. Do we would people eat, tree bark. eat? Well, we still do. It's actually healthy for you, and it's good. Tree bark. Yeah. I don't. Sure. Are you calling kale tree bark? No. <laughs> I mean, Cal is pretty in small quantities, activated charcoal is perfectly safe to consume, even if the proportion health benefits are scientifically dubious. Uh, what happens if you eat charcoal? When you take it by mouth, activated charcoal can cause black stools, black tongue, vomiting, or diarrhea. Um, however, it, you can eat it, and women eat it too sometimes when they have... Um, to help them poop. No, when they're pregnant, for some reason, their body like. But didn't they just say that it was bad for you? It, in large quantities, but in in small quantities, it's perfectly safe. So, uh, mm. so that what they would do is like they would like, you know, dust it up and like put it on. So, it's weird. It's it's not something you should be eating, but you can eat it. That is an interesting fun fact. <clears throat> Watch this. Uh, do I'm watching. What am I watching? Preg pregnant women. Uh, I I guess that's the only. People can be Ooh. pregnant. But, uh, it says you. <laughs> uh, eat charcoal. Yep. Activated charcoal may be safe in pregnancy if you're only taking it occasionally. That said, consuming activated charcoal should only be done under supervision of your healthcare provider. One potential risk of taking activated charcoal involves constipation. I, I don't know what the difference between activated charcoal is and charcoal, but, uh, but you can brush your teeth with charcoal. Let's see. Uh, uh, activated charcoal is where ordinary charcoal has been treated to increase its surface area. Oh, interesting. Non-activated charcoal is exactly how the carbonated wood comes out of the kiln. Mm, interesting. Mm. Interesting. All righty. Hmm. <laughs> That's so weird, though. Well, I guess people... Weirdest <laughs> thing... People can eat healthy. But weirdest thing people can eat. Mm, I think living squid. Oh, and survive. And survive. And survive. <laughs> survive. I have to add that one. Hard pack is a simple biscuit made oh, yeah, from like water and flour, which is then baked till it's rock hard. Yeah, basically, that's that stuff that they would have, like the, the military rations during like the Civil War. Penis fish. <laughs> what the hell is a penis fish? It's a penis fish. I'm terrified. People, the other white meat. That's funny. Let's see what penis fish is. Penis fish, otherwise known as eel, Urchis unchinctus. The penis fish is not actually a fish, but a type of marin spoon worm. Uh, oh, you could drink urine. It's actually healthy for you. Penis fish. People, the other other white meat. <laughs> Wait, that's really funny. That's crazy. What the hell? Fruit bat soup? Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, we, we, we found that one out. Is it a sea urchin? You need a dead seal and several hundred ox, which is kind of like a seabird. They are hollowed out seals. Yes, whole seals. Then the seal is sewn up. The remaining air squeezing out fat rubber onto... Yeah, I don't, I don't have time for that. What about haggis? I don't know. Haggis? Haggis. Ugh. Haggis? Yes, if I miss, I think it's like sheep's stomach that's like stuffed. A Scottish it's, dish consisting of a sheep's or calf's uh, offal mixed with what's ha suet, it, what is oatmeal, it, nuts? and seasoning and boiled in a bag. Traditionally, one made from the animal's stomach. And that's how you become successful. <laughs> uh, yes, haggis. Let's take a look at this. That's gross. I've never actually seen haggis. Yeah, it's nice. Looking. Oh, that definitely does not look good. At yeah, all. I wouldn't need. I just looked at it. I don't need to see it again. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't need to see haggis. Um, what? I definitely do not want to eat haggis. Although, I, oddly enough, I, I don't know. Some of your right ex-girlfriends now. have been a little haggis. <laughs> <laughs> this you is don't Thomas date. Show. Oh. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I was like, you don't date. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Is that is that tonight? Oh, you know what it is? It's five o'clock. It's dinner time. Look at that. Two hours on the dot almost. Let's try to get two hours on the dot. We got uh, five seconds. Yeah, yeah we do. <sighs> Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.